Hello, I'm Scott Soshnick. And I'm Evan Novi williams and this is the College Sports Untapped Millions Sports Business Podcast, The Sportacast. Mr. Ben Sutton is the guest. Now, Ben, I like to grade Evan's openings. Like when I say, you know, this, this is the, the Untapped College Sports Millions. Now, I don't think he brought all the enthusiasm that he normally does. So I'm going to lower the score on the enthusiasm. But... That that was like foreshadowing. I'm peaked now. What like college sports? I would think is ringing every penny out of every aspect. Evans telling me that maybe that's not the case. So I'm going high on degree of difficulty. I enjoyed that. Your overall evaluation of Evans' intro, please. Uh, there are untapped billions still <laughs> in college sports. I, I, I understand so it's accurate by, by, it's, by an order of magnitude. It's it's still it's still after all these years it's still uh, there's so much unharvested opportunity. I mean, there's yeah, nothing I, I, nothing bigger I, than college I think that's a good place. There. So. I think that's a good place to start because I am of two minds on this topic, Ben. I, people are talk about college sports getting increasingly professionalized. A part of me feels like college sports is professional sports. And then I think more about what I think you're talking about here, the, the many ways, the millions and maybe billions that, that a lot of schools and conferences are leaving on the table just because of how archaic a lot of the business models are. So, Evan, are. let's just say it's, it is professional sports. It's, and, Ben, you can expound on this now. It's just poorly run professional sports. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the, maybe that's the perfect answer. <laughs> there, it, 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 I would call it kind of in between. I would call it kind of semi-professional. I think, you know, there, there are half million athletes, I think, in the in – the, in, in NCAA, at NCAA institutions around the country. And, and most of them really are on campus to get a degree. And large preponderance of them are first-generation college students. And all the research says that with a college diploma, you're going to make three to three and a half X uh, what the person, the normal regular American makes that doesn't have a college diploma. And so... Um, you know, so I, I think yeah, but part of the deal for me is, like, you have to be careful with the broad strokes because we, we're really just talking about college football and college basketball. For sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and so um, the women's tournament just got a big bump in their new deal, um, but it's still pennies on the dollar compared to the men's basketball tournament. Um, but I do think there's massive opportunity to harvest from women's sports. But I'll start. I'll start with a controversial comment. Probably as good as the deal is that uh, Commissioner Tony Petiti has in the Big Ten, and that Commissioner Greg Sankey has in the SEC, and these are superlative sports executives. Um, as good as those deals are for their schools, if there were a super football conference of fifty to seventy-five schools, there's no way those rights would be worth less than a hundred million dollars per year per school. And so it dwarfs what the two leading uh, conferences make right now. There are all kinds of issues that create that, not the least of which is that college sports doesn't have an antitrust exemption. And, and so they, they are, you know, the, the NCAA uh, president, I've been friendly with every NCAA president that has been in the job for the last 35 years. Um, it, they should rename the job Chief Cat Herder for 1,400 member university <laughs> presidents. I mean, they don't have power. And so they're not like yeah. a commissioner. So it's hard, it's, it is hard to get a solution put together. Um, but, but as long as they play at the fiefdom level, which is where college sports is now, instead of a national level, like the pro sports leagues, we're going to keep having what we have right now. So, Evan, if there was a uh, sort of a cinematic uh, way of picturing this, uh, I'm going to an old school film, uh, Rocky, you may be familiar with it, uh, where, he, where Mickey has him chasing the rooster. Hmm. Like, I, I, I just picture all the, the school presidents chasing the rooster, except it's like dressed up as a dollar bill. <laughs> they just can't quite catch. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, it's, uh, it, it is a very... So looking... Go ahead. Looking into so looking into your crystal ball, um, what do you think college sports structure wise? Is it still this fight, fiefdom in five years? Does college football is it separate? Is college football and basketball separate? Is it Big Ten and SEC? Is it a different amalgamation at the top? What, what does it look like in your mind in five years? I, I think it will definitely evolve from where it is 
but I, but I also, I, got, I mean, we have to get back again. I've worked in the college sports space for, I don't know, 38 years now. And, um, you know, one thing has never changed, that colleges and universities do not move fast. Okay, just on their own, they don't move fast. They're not nimble. They're giant lumbering bureaucracies like the federal government or state government. Um, and, and I, you know, I personally, um, you know, I happen to think that the federal government spends most of its time in, in the form of the enemy of capitalism. So you don't want the National Labor Relations Board uh, or Congress. I mean, you know, the 435 people that are in, in Congress, I mean, for, for 385 of them, it's the best job they've ever had. Do you really want people like that making a decision about where the business is going to go? And, well, for and me, so, it seems like it seems to me the leadership does want that right now. They, they, Aren't they, they asking for Congress's I, help? I, I think they, they I think if if you could boil it down to its essence to have some assistance at the level where it would be OK for the parties to sit in a, in a room and talk about what this might look like together um, without having 10 lawyers for every commissioner that's in the room, for instance, uh, and 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 in a way where it wouldn't look like collusive activity, um, then yeah, I mean I think that's where the government can help. And and so, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I just I just think that there's nothing that government can do that that private industry can't do better. And so I I you know I I really hope that what will happen is that they'll get the space to where they can sit in a room and they can talk about what this could really look like. And that might be a profession, a, a semi-professional college football league, or it might include men's basketball, or they might suck men's and women's basketball into it. But it may just be football by itself. And, and you know, when I, when I had my, my first company, ISP, when I started that company in 1992, 50% of the book of business in the company was, was college basketball and 50% was college football. By the time I sold wow. my company to Teddy Forsman in 2010, we were 80% football and 20% basketball, and basketball had continued to grow, okay? That just meant that football was on an arc like this. When I sold with George Pine IS, IMG Worldwide to Silver Lake Capital and WME in 2014, College football was 85% of our business. And again, basketball is 15 and basketball was still growing. So, so the art uh, on college football is, is, was, and is, and will continue to be remarkable if we don't screw it up. And um, the appetite for it's amazing. And, you know, I, I really, I, I actually wish some smart person, I should probably have one of my research assistants do this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you aggregated all of the college football sports windows and took all of those ratings together and you, and you, and you, you basically um, you compared it on a more proportional basis to what the NFL is, I'm, I'm sure the ratings would dwarf professional football. I mean, the number of people, the number of people that consume college football is – in my opinion, far superior to the number of people that consume college, uh, professional football. And and that's just a function of having 130-some teams that play at the FBS level versus having 32 teams play at, at the professional level. And Ben, let me ask you this, though, because you went pie in sky there. You said, if we don't screw it up and if we can work together, that, that to me is pie in sky. Um, and you brought up the NFL. So let me go back in history, as you just did, you know, a little recounted your history of, of your transactions. Uh, back in the day, before the NFL was the behemoth, we know it now. You know, Wellington Mara had to be, and I, I'm going to use air quotes here, convinced that he couldn't just care about the New York Giants, even though big market. He had to share. It, 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 was, it would behoove the Giants for the competitors to be strong businesses as well that he had to sacrifice for the good of the whole because ultimately it would benefit him. I don't see a world in which university presidents, athletic directors, go in, go in a room and that message is sold and people are buying in. I just don't see it. Do you see that as a possibility? I see it. I, think, I do think that you're right that the handicap against it is high, um, but, I, but I think it is possible. And, 
And I mean, I'm literally, utterly convinced in my soul that if you had a, you know, let's say 72 team, uh, four or six division national football conference uh, countrywide, uh, that, that, that those rights, the, the combination of all those media rights between uh, linear cable streaming, that the combination of those rights would be would dwarf what the schools harvest from those rights now. Uh, and the reason is because they have these many cartels negotiating against the media companies versus the NFL, which has a national cartel. And, and so, so it, 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 I mean, it really, the, the fundamentals of the business are, are just structurally so different. And, and so, I, you know, if, if, if they can get past the, the fiefdom stage, and there's, there, are people, there are people in our space that want desperately for that to happen and, you know, and don't want this to just evolve into having, um, you know, I mean, even if you're Greg or, 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 or Tony, you don't, you don't want to have, um, you know, two leagues, and those leagues are all that matter in the United States of America because we're not tapping into the overall potential of college football. And so, you know, I don't think it's a – I do think there is a group that would like to see this be 24 to 36 teams, right? Um, and, and if you're in the SEC or the Big Ten and that ever happened, you have to ask yourself if you're the athletic director, I won't name schools, but, you know, would my league, would my team make the cut? <laughs> You know, yeah. would I be in the new upper league if they ever had a true premier league? Um, and, you know, and we all know the answer to that. So, I, I, you know, in, personally, in some ways, the, I, I feel like in some ways I feel like, Scott, the 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 some of the socialism aspects of the NFL are already in college sports to a degree. Right. Northwestern gets the same Big Ten check of media that that, that Michigan gets even though you can make an argument that one of them is earning a lot more for the conference than, than oh, the other. Oh, and those schools have made that argument. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, and then you keep the local revenue. One of the things, Ben, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on, um, j just hearing you talk about the potential revenue boost of people joining together and the collectivization makes me think about private equity, which is a, a group that is investing across professional sports right now and is obviously looking very intently at schools, at the college, at the conference, maybe at the CFP level. Uh, what do you think the, the avenue is there? Do you think we see deals done soon? And, and what do you think structurally ends up uh, essentially allowing this marriage of private equity and, and higher education? I mean, I, I, I personally think it's a tough putt. Um, you know, I, I understand why people in the private equity space are interested in it. And it's something that I've looked at for the last six or seven years. But you're, you're talking about investing in entities that take in, if it's a university that has a $2.5 billion budget, their normal pr process is to spend $2.5 billion dollars. You know, these are, these are by definition yeah. not-for-profits, okay, and they do not have a profit motive, and they really don't understand the profit motive in, in many cases. And so, so, you know, if you go bet on a college athletic department that has a $180 million budget at, in revenue and they spend $179 million of it every year, um, you know, I mean, what are you? What do you get as a security interest? Um, you know, for your investment. I mean, are, are, I mean, do you give up the? Do you give up the seating rights in your stadium? Do you give up the title to your stadium if you default on the deal? I mean, it's it's really it's it's a hard. I mean, it's like I'm getting ready to play in this golf tournament in Palm Springs. I mean, this is a downhill side hill <laughs> putt with an old putter in your hand. And so, I mean, they're Is smart guys. footer probably, or 80 so, footer? So, <laughs> so we've got undulations. Probably yeah, you've got undulations in the green, and you've got participants who get the yips. Yeah, the correct. And so, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a way, and I've talked to a lot of different people about it. And, and I could, you know, I could probably be convinced, but, but based on spending near four decades in this space, um, I, I just think that that, uh, I mean, it's a, it will be a massive cultural change, uh, and paradigm shift 
in, in terms of how college athletic departments are operated if all of a sudden they're beholden to an outside investor. And, and again, I, I, it, it's I, I honestly, and I actually believe it is going to happen, and it's going to happen at some schools. I'm going to tell you that I don't think I would put, based on what I know today, I don't think I'd put my money in it. You lost me when you said they don't know how to run a profit. <laughs> I'm out. I mean, I mean, it's just if not. If this is Shark Tank, I'm out. Yeah, I mean, so what, what do you do? Like, so, I mean, again, we always, like, everybody always talks about college sports. We really need to narrow the focus down. Are we talking about just college football? We're we talking about just college basketball. Are you going to pay the players to play, which, by the way, that's already happening. Um, you can call it whatever you want to. Uh, and, you know, are you going to and, – and then are you going to pay players that play field hockey and women's tennis and men's soccer? And, and, and where is that money going to come from? And, and one of the things people don't talk about often in this context is that, you know, the universities have to uphold their Title IX, uh, you know, live into the Title IX requirement, Right. But if the NCAA relaxed the sport minimum, and let's say they said you could only have, you don't have to have but 10 sports to be a Division I program, um, and, and all this money's flooding over to football, and some money's flooding over to men's basketball, I can promise you that the only way to get back to zero in your budget is to drop sports. There's, there's simply no other way um, for this to go forward unless schools are going to get in the business of largely subsidizing their athletic departments through additional investment in order to have those opportunities offered. So it's, it's you know, I, I mean, I really, I kind of like talking about it in the context of there's college football and then way behind that there's college basketball and then way behind that there's kind of everything else. How do you create the balance in, in, in those three, frankly, competing priorities? I'll tell you something else. Well, I'll, I'll make, I'll go make ahead. an argument. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I, I, I was just going to football games this fall. And uh, 21 college football games. I've been on 27 campuses since the beginning of football season. Every athletic director I meet with, every single one, tells me that they're, they're struggling now. You know, everybody's criticizing athletic depart departments for the last 20 years for all the buildings they're building the Taj Mahals for football or basketball or whatever it might be. I mean, you know, people all have their opinions about what, what is right, what is wrong, et cetera. All the money that was going to capital projects is drying up because the pie is the pie. The donor says, I've got this much to give to Wake Forest. I've got this much to give to Alabama, okay? So now, instead of giving 25% of my money to renovate the football stadium or to build a new football center, I'm going to take that. I'm going to still give them my 75% annual gift. All these same athletic directors are telling me uh, athletic giving for annual fundraising is not going down, but it's not growing like it used to. But the capital fundraising has dried up because all that money has gone straight to NIL. And so, I mean, this this will have a profound impact on other sports, not just those sports, long term. And um, so they're all, of course, they're all looking for more revenue and nobody wants to drop sports. And I don't blame them. If I were an athletic director, it'd be the worst possible thing I could think of doing. But the realities are, is, is that if you focus on kind of bottom line economics and all the money's flooding over here, what will you do for the rest of the enterprise? I think the counter uh, the counter argument to, to a degree of that you mentioned at the beginning that that in a in an ideal world or in a world where things are more concentrated, the, the biggest schools can be getting a hundred million dollars in in media check every year, right? Which is not what they're getting now, even with the new deals. Some, some schools are getting in the fifty to sixty and maybe even seventy range. So theoretically, there there's there is more media money coming to these schools as the sands of, of college sports shift. And then I, I want to get into one of, another one of your businesses. Revel XP as an example, but I think that there is a host of revenue opportunities that college sports athletic departments, particularly in football and basketball, but we're seeing it in sold out volleyball arenas and things like that. I think there's a lot of stuff like hospitality 
like maybe monetizing stadiums more, real estate opportunities mm -hmm. that we're seeing professional sports do that college sports either don't have the expertise or the willpower or the ability or the speed, the, the agility, all, whatever it is, are not doing. And I can make an argument, I think, that, that in some world where we really professionalize, even if it's just football and basketball, that, 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 that there is more money on the table to be made through a lot of those avenues. And, and, and you are correct, and that is why, uh, well, there's multiple reasons why I didn't retire, but, um, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I, I saw this, air, this space as a space that I believed where we could have a profound impact really not just in college sports. I mean, I, I thought that there, this was being done well in professional golf and a few premier events around the country, but I didn't think this was being done well, uh, you know, it, kind of at a granular level around, around the, the country. You're talking hospitality specifically. Hospitality. And, and you know, the yeah. thesis for us is to say to an athletic director, an NFL team president, we can take your fan from their front door through the game day experience and back to their front door. And, and we really have that capability and as you know, we work with probably, I don't know, 90 of the top 120 or 30 schools in the country, along with some NFL teams and Major League Baseball and pro golf and horse racing and other things. Um, but but it, it's also, um, you know, I remember when I traveled around the country when I retired as chairman of, of IMG uh, College, and I kind of took this little tour just to go around and thank all these athletic directors who believed in me for so many years and invested and, and you know, partnered with us. And we were so privileged to work with over 200 different schools. And I just want to say thanks. But as I did, I was kind of on a listening tour, too. And I ask every, just like I'm asking them now, what's happening on the fundraising side of your business? I ask them what keeps them awake at night. Now, obviously, every athletic director lives in mortal terror of you know, a telephone picking up something <laughs> in a bar that some football player does stupid and ends up on social media. But beyond that, you know, beyond that, um, what, what they all said to me was, you know, we, we've looked at the same research that, you know, your firm has produced and professional sports, college sports, music, entertainment, they're all seeing massive declines in young consumers, right? So they're not getting the Gen Zs, they're not getting the millennials, they're not, you know, and, and so, so our, our approach has been to say, okay, what, the things we've learned, they love fellowship and they love community and they love being together more than any generation since the, the uh, 1960s love children, okay, the, the millennials do. But they don't wanna have to necessarily do all the work that's required to have that premium game day experience, but they're also willing to pay for that premium game day experience as long as you create something that is share worthy, right? And so, so really something like 35% of our consumers are people that are under the age of 35 years old. And, mm -hmm. and if you ask, if you go on campuses where we're doing business now and you ask the head fundraiser, what's the best source of prospects he has now, it's gonna be Revel XP because we're, we're bringing people in, and so they've now demonstrated a propensity to follow that team, and so now those fundraisers can tap into them and try to sell them game tickets and season tickets and you know get them to join the Rams Club at Carolina or the Deacon Club at Wake Forest or the Hokie Club at Virginia Tech. And, and so, I, I, and so that, there's that part of it, but then in the short term, um, taking some of your premium real estate and creating premium experiences instead of just giving it away uh, just makes all the sense in the world. The colleges are usually about 20 years behind the pros in, in this kind of ideation. But in this particular case, the colleges are kind of even with the pros. And yeah. because this, this movement of the last four and a half to five years has just taken off. And, um, and so we're seeing, you know, that business is, is doing great. And as I said, we have relationships with 85 or 90 schools and, and the CFP and, and others, and, and the, the business grows 25 to 30 partners a year because team presidents and athletic directors recognize exactly what you just said. We've got to create new sources of revenue. But in addition to that, there's this other piece, this long-term strategic piece where we're developing new consumers for the universities. Um, back in the day, Alabama had something like 20,000 student tickets at, at Bryant-Denny Stadium. 
And now it's, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but now it's maybe half that. And, <laughs> yeah, and, and, the, and the stadiums are being filled up with boomers, but, you know, honestly, one day we're all going to die and not be there. So what do you do to kind of generate a next generation of followership? And that's really what that, that's the whole mission of that business. I just love the fact, Ben, that you talked about fans 35 and under and that for the first time in a very long time on this podcast, Novi Williams is not in that demographic. <laughs> it's like he's an old man now. And now in the upper half of, the, uh, of, yeah. of that line. Yeah. So could, could you, Ben, could you walk me through, just for folks, like we use um, overarching terms like uh, experiential and premium and all, all that. Can you give me an example? Give me a game day example at – Pick your school. doesn't matter to me. Maybe something like a national champion like Syracuse. Oh, I'm sorry. That was my alma mater. Wishful thinking. I apologize. But can, can you walk me through? A shovel a, snow. Yeah, I'm sorry. They, wait, Syracuse yeah. didn't win the national championship? My bad. Can, can you just walk me through an experience game day at – and I, I, you know what? Everybody always goes to Alabama. And forget Michigan. They just had a lot of success. Give me another school and give me an example of that sort of front door to game to back home experience. What, what do I get for my money? Yeah, so so I mean, it it can be a myriad of things, but it you know the 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 largest part of our business is creating premium, essentially tailgate experiences at college football games um, for uh, consumers, and and so we've got a sales team that's in the field that's drumming up business, um, and from folks to say, hey, you know, why don't you come over and bring twenty of your friends and go to the football game and. You show up and you've got a climate controlled tent if it's if it's in a place like Syracuse, if it's in beautiful sunny Winston Salem or Palm Desert, maybe not. You don't need it. But you've got satellite television in your tent, you've got all your food, your tickets are there, you're all seated together. Um, we can even basically take you from your homes and t- get you to the stadium and back to your home. Um, and you know, and so the experiences range from from that, which is kind of a you know, it's a premium product, but it's not cost prohibitive to incredible travel packages where people travel to the college football playoff and stay in the best hotel in Houston, Texas. And and we have uh, Legends events and and a private concert with Cole Swindell. And, you know, and, and then they sit in suites in the best seats in the stadium and have private clubs that are available only to those consumers. Um, it really runs the gamut, but it's basically just saying nobody, literally no program in America is maximizing their real estate. And so our job is basically to come in and help them do that and, and in so doing also create this next, next legion of fans. Yeah, it's so bizarre so, to me in a, in a professional world where your sort of your entertainment districts are so popular around the stadiums that it's all about real estate. Go ask Stan Kroenke. Mm-hmm. Go ask some of these other owners. It's all about real estate and how do they ring, ring the uh, – look, look at Patriot Place. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tell the story of when I go up there with my son and we're going out. We're, we're playing with a hockey team and we're trying to plan lunch. People would drive an extra five miles to go to the Olive Garden at Patriot Place because they get to look at an empty stadium. Right. It's insanity, but it, it, it sure does speak to the appeal and the power of the brand and the sport. It's the, ben, when, when you when, – when Hold you on, s- Evan. Let Ben tell me how genius I am. Hold on a second. My God. That's ben was going to praise me right there. I could tell. That's genius. <laughs> <laughs> Would you repeat that, Ben, one more time? Uh, you broke up for a second. Can you one more time, Ben? That's what? There'll be royalties on the repetition. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. Okay, it's your turn, Novi Williams. When, when you see, uh, pick an NFL team, when you see the, the Packers and the tailgate scene is people drive in early with their own trucks and they bring out their own grill, do you just see that as a massive mon- money lost opportunity for the NFL team? I, I that, do. That instead of having people do it themselves, that there is an opportunity to facilitate it, make it easier, and therefore make money off it? That, so here's, here's what I would say about it. Our, our research shows that, you know, that if you're – 40 or 45 or older, um, you're still kind of married to that model, right? In, in many cases. And so, um, but the younger consumers, they just, I mean, frankly, they want to show up and they want to have the experience ready-made for them and it plays kind of right into the thesis. And so, um, and, you know, and, and then it becomes kind of a, it becomes kind of legendary and the experiences we're providing are legendary 
And I think about places like, you know, Auburn, where our business is four times what it was uh, eight years ago and, or seven years ago. Our, you know, Texas A&M and Texas, which are four times bigger than they were just three years ago. And people see it and they go, gosh, that's pretty easy. <laughs> I didn't have to spend all day Friday, take work off to go do all the stuff. I didn't have to grill anything. They've got five-star catering. They've got great tickets. They've got beautiful tents. All the accoutrements, they've got great service. We have bellhops running all over the place. And it becomes, you know, the experience becomes pretty legendary. So almost, almost everywhere we go, not almost, every single place we go, people that for 20 years have tailgated on their own, we see movement from that group to come over and have the ready-made tailgate. And, and uh, it's, just, you know, and, and I think, I mean, again, I, I understand why uh, teams want to honor traditions, but I also don't understand when you look in your stadium and you're an NFL playoff team and it's the 16th game of the season and you have 48,000 people in the stadium, in a 66,000 seat stadium. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't process that. I mean, I used to say this when I was in the media business. I, I mean, challenge our sales guys all the time, you know, be out of the market all the time. If we had 140 avails in a, in a radio network broadcast or, or 16 in a television broadcast to sell and we only parted with 14 of the 16 and 120 of the 140, that's gone. That re that's revenue yeah. that flew over our heads that we never harvested for our properties. And so, um, I, you know, I, I think that you can kind of have both. But I believe that ultimately that, that, pe that there's this groundswell. I mean, again, we had 18 unique clients when we bought the four little companies that we bought to start Revel XP four years ago. All right. Today they have 110. So there's this groundswell you, of, of teams that go, how, we don't want to miss on that. How do you structure your deals with schools? Is it is it gar cash guarantee? Is it a revenue share of what you're doing? What's it, the, is it a mix it, of both? What's it's, the structure? It, no, it's revenue share. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, because, I mean, it, you know, there was certainly risk in my old world. I think the last year I was uh, chairman and CEO of IMG, we, we uh, sent out something like $600 million in in rights fees and revenue uh, shares to universities um, with probably 250 to 300 million of that was probably, it was probably actually more than that was guaranteed. Um, you know, in that business, it was a little bit easier to ascertain in this business. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're talking about having uh, at a football, at a college football program, you're talking about having seven Saturdays, six Saturdays, eight Saturdays, you're weather dependent, you're win and loss dependent to some degree. Um, what we try to do is the same thing we do with the CFP. We were 80% sold out of our CFP national championship packages before anybody knew who the four final teams were going to be. And so we had our- How's that possible? Who's the, buying those? Uh, pe people, just hopeful fans or people uh, that are going regardless? There were probably, there were probably, I guess, you know, 15 or 20% hopeful fans, but I think it's just, frankly, I think it's guys like me that just love college football and say, I'm going to the national championship no matter who wins, just like people go to the Super Bowl. And, and so we've been- It was been all there. of Syracuse, Evan. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, I will tell you this, I was, Scott, I was, I was a long time proud member and founding member of the board of the Falk School of uh, Sports Management at Syracuse University. So, Dave, great David is a friend. I, I was not Falk School, that, that, that obviously came after me, but I'm a, I'm a Newhouse grad, broadcast journalism. Uh, graduate I heard a Syracuse, lot of but, Newhouse guys at ISP and IMG. I, I'm sure you did. You're probably underpaying them, too, for the right oh, to did. work in college sports. Yeah. I hear you. I know. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> You're fun. Uh, uh, can you settle a bet here, Ben? Eben and I, we always, we always have debates in the newsroom and what the heck. You're here. You'll be a good arbiter. You sound like a very – you would make a good arbiter. So, you know, when you're done with this, when you want to retire, you go into arbitration. <laughs> okay. Who do you think of first? You hear the name Steve Austin. Who do you think of, the $6 million man or the wrestler? That's the $6 million man. Thank you very much, Ben Sutton, one for Soshnik. Uh, <laughs> second one, the Buffalo Bills are paying folks 20 bucks an hour to show up and shovel snow. Is that enough money? Uh, not a chance. 
<laughs> oh, okay. One Thank for you. one for Novi yeah, Williams. All right, one and yeah. one today. Not bad. I'll take it. I, <laughs> why isn't twenty bucks enough to show up? You don't have to do it. You're volunteering. You're going to get twenty bucks and say you did it. Oh, that's funny. I don't understand. Why is that not enough? <laughs> I just think if you're a billionaire and and the reason they're shoveling is to get your multi billion dollar uh, NFL playoff game off the ground, I think maybe you should offer more than twenty dollars yep. an hour. Yeah. But I see I see a Revel XP analogy here though, Ben. Let me know if I'm on. And it's me because we just had our first snowstorm here in in the New York area. Uh, I tradition. For me, my father would have would have done like, no way did he pay anybody to shovel snow. It was me, and you know, you got a kid, you get outside, you shovel the snow, right? Yeah. But I'm now at a point where I got to be concerned about stroking out. So I mean, I am thinking about paying the kid twenty bucks, you know, next door when he shows up with the shovel. That I used to dale, tailgate. I do see the dream scenario. If I'm going to have a clam bake on the beach, I don't bring anything. Somebody shows up, they clean up, they do everything. Sign me up for that. You're doing and the I heated think, tent and the TV. Yeah, yeah, out. yeah. So yeah. I'm getting close to having somebody shovel my driveway because I'm afraid of stroking out. And I think it's the same thing in, the, in sort of the, uh, the Revel X people. I don't want to do the work anymore. Just, like, just have it easy, clean, I'm done, I'm in, right. and then I can have a good time. <laughs> That's great. All right. Awesome. Well, well, thank you very much to Ben Sutton. You can find Ben on Twitter at Ben Ooh, Sutton. You did, you, you did the Twitter thing. Good did, for you, did. Evan. You, you can prepared. find Scott Soshnick on Twitter at Soshnick. You, you can go. find me I, on Twitter. I like to talk over him when he does this, Ben, to see if he's going to screw it up. The show is produced by Eric He's got Greenwald. good focus today. Look at him. He's Aaron. rocking a little bit. He's trying to keep focus. Editor Cora Veltman would like you to know that you can follow the show at Sportico. Yeah, hub of. The hub of the Sportico Media Network.